light mode or dark mode. People can get religious about this thing. And if you're in the light mode camp, you're gonna wanna stick around for this video because it's gonna add to your argument. Now, for me personally, I've always been in the dark mode camp, but after this, I'm gonna have to reconsider. You see, I've always loved dark mode. I use it on my desktop, my laptop, even my phone. If it has dark mode capabilities, I'm turning that on. But in this case, I actually had a need for dark mode. Let me show you. A lot of times I use a teleprompter to read a script while making these videos so I can look at the camera, as you can see here. Now this works great. However, with the brightness of the script on the screen, it creates a glare that messes with the output of the video. So I've messed with the brightness and things like that, but nothing really seemed to work. And let me show you why it matters. This is how I normally look. And then when I have the script up on the screen, do you kind of see that difference? So you can see how it makes things look a little cloudy over my image when I'm recording videos like this. So what I did was I went and looked for a browser extension since I'm looking at these PDFs via the browser that can make the PDF script in dark mode and not be so bright on the screen. So after searching for a bit, I found this one called dark PDF that seemed to do exactly what I needed. However, when I went to install the extension, that's when my first suspicion started to come into play when it prompted me for access to all websites and not just specific sites or files that I would need to use this extension for. So thankfully I had this sneaking suspicion from the start because that motivated me in how I approached using this extension. And what I would do is I would only enable it via the browser extension capabilities when I needed it and then disable it once I was done recording videos like this. In addition to that, before installing the extension, I also checked out the GitHub repository and it looked like the developer behind it was making it in good faith. They just had a need for it as well and then shared it on the marketplace with everyone. So the source code looked all good to me, but this is a little bit foreshadowing to what we're going to get to later in the video. And I went about my business. So for nearly a year now, I have been following this workflow of enabling and disabling the extension for a number of videos without any issues or suspicious activity. And Nothing's happened on my machine or any of my accounts that I've been using while working on this computer. Then just the other day, I booted up my PC and I received an alert from my browser indicating that this extension was found to be malware and it's been disabled. Now, as you can imagine, my immediate reaction was just surprise and shock and then a little bit of panic. And then I was asking myself, like, what extension was it? What kind of malware? What did it do? How exposed am I? And what do I need to do to respond to this and fix things? Now, this is something where I'll call out to browser vendors. While it's great that they are alerting on this and monitoring extensions in their marketplaces, their stores, if you will, and they alert you to this stuff, they don't really give you a lot of information to work with. So I had to do a lot of Googling and searching to figure out what exactly happened to me with this extension. So I was searching everything from the exact text that the alert gave to me to the name of the browser extension I was using, everything. And I was really coming up short with an answer as to what happened until I decided to look at the GitHub repository where I mentioned earlier in the video that had the source code for this extension. So this is where I landed. It was the dark PDF repository up on GitHub and I found somebody had opened an issue calling out that the extension marked as malware by the Chrome Web Store. And I read through all of this, I looked at the images that they shared and I landed on this comment from Palant or Palant who shared the most useful information that helped me get to a conclusion on what exactly is happening here. So I landed here on Palant's blog post about exactly what they found in their research on this malware that was being distributed via browser extensions, the Karma connection in Chrome Web Store. Now I'll save you the details and give you like a brief summary of it, but I highly recommend you check it out so you can understand more too. One of the big things that I learned from Palant here is that it wasn't just my browser extension that I was using that was impacted by this. It was several other browser extensions with lots of weekly active users, as you can see here from the table that they shared. What's interesting about this in the high level story here is the original author behind these various extensions, which is I think a combination of a bunch of developers behind them. They sold these extensions to some company, which then kept the functionality of the extensions in place but injected the malware on top of it. So what exactly is this malware doing? Well, in Palant's extensive research, they found that for the most part, they're doing two things, affiliate fraud and browser history tracking, basically. The affiliate fraud was new to me, but basically what that does is it has a list of, I guess, e-commerce sites that this back company has affiliation with and got an affiliate code with somehow. And then what they would do is they would see the user that's having this extension, go to those sites that they have affiliates with and inject their affiliate code 
as part of that. So they get kickbacks that way. And that seems to be their main motivation to generate revenue for themselves. And that browser history part, I believe I'm just speculating here is they just want to capture the different URLs you go to so that they can maybe find more e-commerce sites that they could create an affiliation with and get further kickbacks and build up their funds beyond that. But I wanted to check this out myself because I imagine it's a bunch of different extensions and I had just this one extension. I wanted to know exactly what it was doing on my machine. So I went and took a look. I had the code locally still from the extension being installed, albeit disabled. And I analyzed it with AI. All right, so I opened up VS Code. I opened up the folder that the extension was found within and started looking at it in VS Code. And if you're not familiar with browser extensions, they're, it's pretty typical. You have some scripts, you have some style sheets, you have some HTML files and the manifest JSON, which defines basically to the browser what your intentions are with the extension and what it needs access to and that type of thing, all the different ways of describing the extension and what it does. Now, when you go and look at any of the JavaScript that supports this extension, there's going to be something that stands out right away as a red flag. Have you noticed it? All of these files are attempting to be obfuscated, basically trying to hide what the source code is actually doing by making it look like a bunch of garbled text. This makes it quite difficult to just read it yourself and go through it. You can do it, it's possible, but it's very time consuming. And that's where I was like, okay, let me try and have AI analyze this and ask it if it finds anything malicious. So I opened up GitHub Copilot chat using the Claude 3.5 Sonnet preview in particular, and I asked it the following using the workspace so that it has access to look at all of the files and folders in this currently opened workspace in VS Code. Analyze all of it, this browser extension, to see if it is doing anything malicious. Please let me know what you find that it is doing that seems odd or comes across as malware. And right away, within seconds, it found a couple things. It found one, it's using tracking and analytics endpoint, in particular here is where it's sending any data that it's gonna capture through the extension. The extension makes requests to this undocumented API, sending user data, including a user ID, navigator language, refer information, local time, current URL, and then it shows me how it's doing that. It ends up opening up a hidden browser window, one by one pixel in size as a pop-up, make it focus false so it doesn't bring my attention to it. And it opens up the URL to this URL to send the data to it, essentially. Moving on after that, it found that there was URL manipulation. Going back to what we were talking about before, earlier, affiliate fraud, this is where it was doing that. It would inject the attributes into the URLs on their behalf, on our behalf, without us knowing it. And then in terms of the data collection that it was using, which is one thing that helped make me feel a little bit relieved because I don't, I'm not worried about my browsing history, although it is an invasion of privacy. I'm not worried about what's there, but I am concerned whether it had access to the forms in the pages. So if I'm entering in login details or that sort of thing, then that would be a little bit more scary to me because then I need to you know, worry about what it captured in that aspect. Maybe it's usernames, passwords, emails, addresses, that type of thing, right? But in this case, it was just capturing the refer. So where I was coming from when I maybe I clicked on another link or something like that and where I was going. And that's what leads me to believe in my speculation around that their objective is just to make money in a illegitimate way, but what they maybe feel a gray area in terms of legitimacy by getting more affiliate kickback funds. So they're trying to track user history to see what other e-commerce sites that these users that are actively using these extensions are going to so that they can add more and generate more money that way. That's what I suspect may or may not be right on that, but that's what leads me to believe since they're only capturing the URL and the refer here. In addition to that, one other thing where this could still be a bit scary in the sense of capturing access tokens and that type of thing is a lot of times those can be found in the URL themselves as a query parameter. So that's something to be aware of in this case too. And that is essentially everything that the AI was able to see looking at the obfuscated code that this browser extension was doing. So it's tracking user behavior, it's creating hidden windows, it's modifying modifying web page content, and then sends data to external servers, right? Along with that red flag that we noticed earlier, that it's obfuscating and minifying the code to hide the functionality of it. And it's giving me the suggestion, you should not be using this extension and you recommend getting rid of it. All right, so at this point, now I have a good idea of what the extension is doing thanks to the AI analyzing the obfuscated code and Palant's post about the details that they found. What do I do? This is what I do. I browse now via the CLI using tools like links or e-links because this doesn't have any browser extensions because I'm not using that anymore. All right, so in reality, my thought still is, what is my exposure for this? 
what is my exposure to this incident that happened? How should I respond to it? What action should I take to try and protect and further limit the impact from this thing? Well, I completely deleted the extension, obviously, even though it was already disabled, I deleted it so it's not on accessible via my browser anymore. I also looked at all of my browser history and took note of any unique site that I visited while having this extension installed. That way I can go through and change the passwords for all of them, prioritizing the highest, most important ones first, working my way down the list to the lower priority ones. I also, and this is what you should do right now in response to this video, I went and audited all of my other browser extensions and removed any that seemed suspicious or asking for too many permissions then would be necessary for the purpose of that extension. Now, the last thing to note here about response to this is going back to what I said earlier, I did my due diligence when installing this extension, when I searched for it, when I researched the source code behind it, and I felt fairly comfortable with the extension other than the fact that it need that elevated permissions. But this highlights something that we see throughout the industry and throughout the world, which is supply chain attacks. Typically, we talk about it as supply chain attacks via open source dependencies in your software, but this is a supply chain attack in my browser extension. The original author had great intention behind it as far as I could tell, and then they sold it off to somebody that had this malicious intent to inject malware like this, and thus changing the state of that extension underneath my nose without me really noticing it. So this serves as a reminder to myself, but I'm sharing with you all too, as a reminder to be cautious when we are relying on third parties, even when they seem fine on first use, that could later change. As I mentioned before, this is typical with what we call supply chain attacks. And you can find out more about those in the blog post linked in the description below. That covers all the pain and suffering that I went through in order to share this story with you. And hopefully it brought value to you and acts as a reminder to be aware of these types of things. Be cautious of supply chain attacks. And if it did, it'd be so great if you like and subscribe to the channel because that will just lessen the pain that much more for me. This was not fun. Thanks for watching and happy safe coding, everyone.